because it's really good at LSD. Um, and, uh, but at the end of that, I felt guilty because my mom was paying a little bit of tuition and uh, taking out a five hundred dollar loan. And I'm like, yeah, I can't do that to my mom. She, they, my, my parents are not wealthy. They weren't in poverty. Um, so I dropped out and I uh, took a two year trip to Europe, the Middle East, Asia. I ended up in Kathmandu. Uh, not where that is, it's uh, Nepal, which is north and a little bit east of India. Um, I came back two years later. It's a great time. I mean, it was not just fun. I did a lot of pretty cool stuff. I'm not going to go into it, but uh, trust me, it's been two years. Um, 30 days later, I went from long haired hippie to uniform police officer in my hometown of Cook. Uh, that was a good two years, too. I did that for two years. That's an amazing year. You know, it's like I had not just looked at the other side of the fence, I jumped over the damn fence, uh, and I've been on both sides. Uh, I've, I've seen that. You know, I've seen both those worlds exceptionally close. Um, after I left that, I'll skip a few things, but I did earn a degree at Kirkwood Community College in agricultural mechanics, which is incredibly valuable, even though I've never been a mechanic since then. And I haven't really even driven a tractor since then. Uh, but during that time period, I was lucky enough to write a product, right place, right time, uh, and I just started this little hobby selling herbs and spices, only legal herbs, thank you very much, and um, the natural food store, originally just here in Iowa. Well, here we are, that was 1976, so here we are, whatever, who can do good mental math, uh, 46 years later. And um, it's a three, uh, $200 million company that has 600 employees. I was the Iowa small business, of, small business person of the year. In 1992. I was the first national runner for America's small business first of the year. Our company got tons of press from the really cool stuff we did that nobody was doing. Uh, in fact, a Working Mother magazine uh, put us on their list for three years in a row uh, as the, one of the best companies in America for working mothers. We were on the 8500 list of one of the fastest growing companies in America. For one year. Uh, but you know, it, it, when I was 49, uh, I had always had a goal of retirement when I was 50. When I was 49, I wasn't rich. I'm still not rich, but I, I didn't have to, uh, to pay for my kids' college education because I hadn't stopped, stopped away. Uh, I had retired. So for about 10 years, maybe 12 years after that, I did a lot of fun stuff that amused me. Uh, hopefully, it didn't irritate anyone. I traveled a lot. Study French in France, Spanish in Spain, China, the Chinese in China. Uh, I have a spot down in Guatemala. I've had it for 23 years now. It's not wealthy or expensive or anything, but it's pretty cool. Uh, you know, and I love it. It's my second home. I just rent a place. It's not expensive. I make $2,000 a year, and that includes gas, electric, water, and trash. So, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't park in my RV in a park for that, that kind of price. It's a really cool place, and I really love that place. And I do volunteer work there, which is basically um, our organization takes kids up volcanoes, and we, not kids, we take adults up uh, volcanoes, we bring them back alive, hopefully they had a great time, and with, with the money that they pay us, we're all volunteers, we run a, a, a K through six school for four people only, uh, and an orphanage for 35 kids, and um, we're the, we supply 110% of the entire yearly operating expenses. We, we, we give them more money than they can spend. But don't worry, they do spend it. But uh, you know, I've, I've got a really big heart and I love to, love to climb, so um, it's been a lot of fun out there. Oh, by the way, I did hike the Appalachian Trail start to finish. Um, so in, in 2012, I was the blue blue sky got interested in politics. Here I am, this is the fifth time I've run for office as a libertarian in Iowa. Uh, US Senate twice against Joni Ernst. Uh, she's, I'm the only person she's ever beaten twice. <laughs> and um, so Lincoln County Sheriff, because of my background in law enforcement, I came in second place out of two. Uh, Secretary of Agriculture for Iowa, because I have ag background, because my dad was a vocational agriculture instructor. And you know, I grew up hanging out with his FFA boys uh, and the full ag students. <laughs> uh, but, <clears throat> It, but right around 2012, I got interested in politics because I, I realized these guys aren't that smart. You know, you, you see them on TV, you see them in the uh, 
the news and read about it and think like, man, I could never do that. And after I looked at politics from the inside, I said, oh man, I know I can practice and I'm a lot smarter than any of those people are. And not only that, I got more honest. Uh, not only that, I think I have a, a, a much more engaging personality because they all wear masks. You know, one mask says Republican, the other mask says uh, this, uh, Democrat, and they don't get to speak anything from their heart. They can only speak the right color of the mask. Uh, you know, that's just the game that they have to play. Um, so uh, I ran five times. This is my fifth time. I'm running for governor of Iowa. Uh, the Libertarian Party of Iowa is the third largest party in Iowa. We're still not there today. The Republicans and Democrats have about 40 times as many registered voters. But uh, nevertheless, we've had candidates for a long time, like 30 years, maybe 35, I don't know how long. Uh, and in order to become a real party in Iowa, as opposed to like this non-party political organization, which is what libertarians are, you have to get 2% of the vote every two years in the presidential election and the governor's election. And then you're a real party in Iowa, which, which means a lot. I'll explain that later if I don't. If I don't. Um, so my goal this year is to get 2% of the vote. I've gotten 2% of the vote every single time I've ever run, so it's not unrealistic that I would get 2% of the vote in this election. And I only have two competitors. You know, I have a Democrat and I have a Republican. So the, 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 it's, it's an ideal situation for me to get 2% of the vote, and then for two years, the Libertarians will be a major party in Iowa, which they deserve to be, because from my perspective, the Libertarian Party is the only party in the United States that has an enduring political philosophy. Now, I'm not going to explain to you what libertarians are, because Google and Wikipedia both exist. And if you don't know how to use them, ask my grandkids, OK? Because it's not that hard. Uh, but what I do want to do, and mostly I'm going to answer questions. And don't worry, if you don't ask questions, I can keep on talking. So you should jump in and ask me questions that, that, so I have to talk about what you care about instead of what I talk about all the time. Um, my, uh, my, all my candidacies have been run on a shoestring. Uh, when I ran for sheriff, I threw a bunch of money in uh, of my own, about $75,000, which is nothing in the grand scheme of things. Uh, but uh, you know, even this year, I, I'm not throwing too much of my own money in. Uh, I'm paying for all the gas in my pickup, which calls a trailer around. Um, I'm uh, covering small stuff, you know, like uh, mailchimp uh, bills and stuff like that. But, uh, uh, you know, Libertarians have never been able to raise a lot of money because there aren't very many of us. Uh, so, you know, we're sort of stuck. I'm sort of surprised that uh, his first name is Randy, right? Is that right? Who remembers who you just got done listening to? Ryan Melton, the previous speaker. Is that What's his first name? Ryan. 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 Yeah. Ryan. I think I got the heart right. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's like he's a Democrat. And he's, you know, he's not going after the money, but um, it's not a surprise that one of the Democrats are giving him $50,000 or let's just say a million dollars. I'm glad he's not here, but, but he's going to lose. <coughs> I'm sorry, but politics is a business. It's not a hobby. It's not a nonprofit organization. It's not a religion. Sometimes they act like this, but it isn't. It is a business. And it's taken me five uh, campaigns to figure out, uh, you know, I need to know the recipe for that business. It doesn't do any good to try and be a politician if you don't know the recipe. Because you're going to lose anyway. It, it makes a lot of sense to learn the recipe and then try and execute. Just because you know the recipe and try and execute doesn't mean you're going to make it. But uh, you know, learn the recipe and then do your best to follow the recipe. And sometimes, about 50-50, you're going to actually be successful if you're a Democrat or if you're a Republican. And that is a major problem in this country. We only have two parties that anybody even knows exists. I, I, mean, I mean, thousands of people in Iowa, and this is only the first, you know, the thousands every time I run, so 50 or whatever that is, 5,000 plus, probably 10,000. Uh, and most of them have never heard of the Libertarian Party. So what we really have is we have an identity problem in, in marketing. It's called uh, nobody knows what you're selling. And of course, we're selling political candidates. So nobody knows who we are, or they sure don't know who our political candidates are. And they never will until we raise our brand awareness. 
If we were alive, we need to know there is a libertarian party. And then hopefully after that they go, and their nominee for governor is the guy I forget where from, but he's sort of cute and old. Uh, that's what the challenge is. Um, there's a whole bunch of other stuff that goes into it. And listening to him um, speak, I realized that like, you know, he doesn't know the recipe. But that's not bad. I didn't know the recipe 10 years ago. And I probably don't know half the recipe today. But uh, it's really important to know the recipe. Because the other thing knowing a recipe does it, is it, it defends you uh, against people who would take advantage of you. Because in Iowa, you know, only a third of the voters in Iowa are registered Republicans. Only a third are registered Democratic, Democratic, uh, a, a tiny amount, like 10 or 11,000 are Libertarians. But a third of all Iowans who are registered to vote, they're nonpartisan. And there's a reason for that. They don't feel comfortable with the Democratic mass. They don't feel comfortable with the Republican mass. And they're looking for someplace else to go. At the end of the day, they're going to vote Democratic or Republican. But they don't register because they're not convinced that the Republican way or the Democrat way is their way. So they give up and they vote for either the Republican or the Democrat, which is why libertarians have never even gotten two percent of the vote in the Detroit race. Um, I think that's really a, a mistake in America. We simply have uh, accepted the fact that the Republicans and Democrats can control the outcome of every election and we're not going to stand up and say, I'd like somebody else, thank you very much. And that's a real tragedy, because when you only have two parties, what they do is they try and divide that voter in the middle. They fight really hard for that voter in the middle, because they can only win if they get 50% plus one of the vote. So believe it or not, you might think, well, they're not talking to me. Well, they, they probably aren't, but they're talking to somebody else. And they're trying to make that somebody else afraid of the competition. Fear is the greatest human motivator. And politicians have perfected the art of making you afraid. And if you just listen to the political discourse in America today, nobody says, oh, I love so and so. What they say is, oh, God, I hope that one doesn't win. I get it all the time. I hear people shouting at me. They say, anybody but you. Know, that's not a really good reason to vote for somebody, is anybody but you. Know, um, and, and the other side is exactly the same way. Like, you know what they did? You can't vote for them. I got 20 postcards, those big colorful ones that will start getting very soon. Two years ago. And uh, I, I say it because you know, I was running in that race. I won all of them from Joe Harrison and from Judas Priest. Uh, and then, you know, later, I had a pile of them in my house. And I, I started looking at them because you know, I, I don't read them when I get them in the mail. And I'm, I'm like, wow, oh, this is really interesting. I put every one of these, these are the big colorful ones. Right? I put every one of them on the floor in front of me. Uh, Joni on the left, because I don't like to go to that right now. Uh, Teresa on the right. And uh, Teresa Greenfield had sent me exactly 20 postcards. And 18 of them were telling me how bad and evil and awful it would be if Joni Ernst was ever our US Senator. Only two, which is 10%, said, Here's how you should vote for me. So I went over to the other side, the left side, and I kind of got Joni. So Joni here sent 19 negative postcards to me. And she only had one positive. And that's the way politics works in America today. And you are either aware of that, or you are a victim of that. And I don't like to be a victim of my own ignorance. I look at things and try and figure out What's really going on here? What's really going on here is politics has been reduced to who can scare the other guy more, or who can make you more fearful of the other guy. And the person that promotes the greatest amount of fear is going to win the election. That's pretty difficult. If we're electing our politicians based on, I, I'm afraid of the other guy, so I'm gonna vote, I don't know who that guy is, but I'm going to vote against her. We are not living in a democracy. We are living in something which has been completely controlled by two parties who are nothing but marketers. That's the only thing they are. They're trying to get you to take a Snickers bar over a, a, a Milky Way. That's all it is. And if you don't pay attention, 
you're, you're the stuff. So pay attention. Now I'm going to open up for questions right away instead of talking about any uh, policies that I have because you know I don't want to bore you with what I, what I think is important. I want, to, I want to get you to tell me what you think is important. So let's go. Have I scared you? That's not intentional. I'm just trying to scare you. Yeah, what do you, what do you think? Whatsoever for turning this world into a place where criminals thrive 
and people die. So that's why the road works number two. Uh, after we've gotten rid of uh, you know, the first couple of those things, we can start working on the others. Because there are other reasons why people uh, um, uh, kill people. But domestic uh, anger after the divorce, that's popular. There's a lot of reasons. But let's go for the big, the big ones first. Then we can work, work, work our way around. Next. Yeah. So what do you feel that your um, winning as a libertarian would mean for the country? Oh, well, I'm going to be If I was as a libertarian in this race, it is going to shake the very the bones of this country because it's virtually impossible. You know, so you're, you're asking a hypothetical that I would love, and that would have an enormous impact, and it's not going to happen. Politics is a business. We already know who's going to win this race. I mean, it's, the odds of you winning this race are about the same as winning the million dollar lottery. Maybe a little bit less. Uh, it's a business. It's hard to figure out. We know who's going to win. We know who's going to win almost every race in the, in the, in the state. That's why uh, there's, I think, 70 out of 150 House and Senate races in Iowa where there's only one candidate. The Republicans didn't even nominate anybody, right? or Democrats didn't even nominate anybody, right? because they know who's going to win. So why should they, who wants to go up against uh, the machine and, and be the sacrificial lamb? Not to maybe Ryan, you know, but he's a Democrat. He's the only Democrat that would run for that office. Think about how pitiful that is. Politics is a business. So, uh, but let's just pretend that way, okay? It's going to send a, a, a tsunami around this entire country if, if a libertarian wins any governorship in any state or any uh, member of the House of Congress or, or obviously the president. Uh, the, the Republicans and Democrats don't, don't want any competition. It just annoys them. Most of they just ignore it. If libertarians get five or ten percent of the vote, they cannot ignore us. And they will both start adopting libertarian principles. Not everyone, but just enough so that the next time there's a vote, they're going to get 50% of the vote. That is amazing. That is absolutely uh, earth shaking uh, if a libertarian at this point in time wins any of those bigger offices, any of those federal offices or governors. Um, so that's what's going to happen. And the entire country will enjoy it. The entire country would love to see the reaction of the libertarian winning in those reasons. Keep firing until somebody else picks it up and shoots it before you do. Okay, so um, I feel that young voters today are leaning more towards libertarian, but kind of also tired of the. I hope you're right. Um, so, seeing as kind of what you just told me was you're not confident that a libertarian could win this race, but you kind of want to edge the voters towards libertarianism. What is your strategy then to engage the youth in voting? Because we are looking for somebody who is more nonpartisan. Well, I hope you're right about younger people. And I, I've also seen it years that that's true. Uh, so I feel that uh, we're, both, we're both right this time. Um, you know, it's, I, I hate to say this like a hundred times, but politics is a game, right? Uh, the game for a, a, a business. And, um, you know, what I'm trying to do is get 2% of the vote, which is going to be about 30,000 votes, 33,000 votes, okay? So my choice of deciding what to do in my campaign is driven by finding 33,000 votes. And it's just a business. It's like, where do you find your customers? Uh, and, and the biggest problem that I have is I don't have an advertising budget to go after young people. I, but I need 33,000 votes. Uh, if I had an advertising budget, a whole lot of it would be directed at, at young people. But, uh, you know, if you know any millionaires that would like to return to win, send them my direction, send me a check, I will spend it by them. Uh, that said, a lot of stuff that I actually, policies that I've been doing, uh, I think are very attractive to young people because those who know their libertarians. Uh, you know, almost all young people understand that legalizing marijuana is like, duh. Why have we done that a long time ago? Um, but there's also policies I have that young people might not like. For instance, I'm completely opposed to uh, forgiving any student loans, uh, except under one condition. If, if we will agree, 
and this requires a constitutional amendment, that never again will the federal government lend any student any money, then I will pay off, I'll be happy to pay off every student loan up, 100%, no questions asked. The student loan program is, it, it costs everybody in this room a lot of money. And I'm not talking about the borrowing money. I'm telling you that all that happened when the federal government started handing out free money and free loans is that all, all the universities, all the private colleges, they just never still on just said, oh, we're going to raise our tuition. Why do you think tuition costs went up? It's not because they started paying their professors more. The universities are a business too, even when they're public universities. And when they saw an opportunity to, to, to raise their tuition, they grabbed it. I mean, who wouldn't? It's free money. Because if you, and I, I can't go no away into this, but the way that student aid works is first, you have to apply. And, you know, people that have money, they don't apply. But the people who like to, they don't have the money or they can't afford the full cost, they apply. And then the, the college or the university goes through and they give you, you know, uh, this kind of scholarship, this kind of scholarship, this kind of work program, and then they, they take your Pell Grant and then they give you a loan at the maximum amount. So you actually end up paying exactly as much as if there was no loan program. Oh yeah, I forgot to say, they, they check the parents' income and they say, well, your parents can't afford to pay 10,000, so we gotta count that, right? They've made up the gap for like years, in 1965, when I went to that high school, that's what they do. They say, well, how much can your parents afford to pay? You know, in my parents' case, I'm like 300 bucks. They say, okay, well, the rest of us all have. If there had been a student loan in there, they would say, oh, okay, uh, your parents can pay 3,000 bucks, uh, the student loan you can get is for uh, $3,000, so your parents can pay the rest. The price went up for you. It's basic math. You don't need to have a degree in economics to understand what happened. It's been well demonstrated over and over again. There's a few colleges, believe it or not, that actually made a public statement that, oh, we're going to raise our tuition. Most of them kept their mouth shut, but that's what they did. So, you know, a lot of students think they're like, well, why can't I have a student loan? No, you don't. Once that student loan program is out of there, it's not going to cost you a nickel because the tuitions, they're, they're just going to go down, or the school's going to give you more money anyway. Uh, so, you know, the students, they like some of my stuff, they don't like some of my stuff. If I could have had a chance to speak to every young person that I would at the same time, uh, you know, we would have a, a nice uh, talk. Uh, you know, I'm fairly convinced that I could convince a large percentage of them, a huge percentage of them, uh, that libertarian ideas are much more feasible, much more fair, uh, much more equitable than anything the Democrats and the Republicans do. Because you have to understand, the Democrats and the Republicans, they're just trying to win an election. They're, they don't care about students. They don't care about old people. They don't care about uh, mental health. The only thing they care about is winning elections. And they do everything that's necessary to win an election, a lot of which is lies, a lot of which is fear. Libertarians, we have principles. You, you might not like some of our principles, but we can talk about our principles. And, and you know, even when we go away and we, we're still disagreeing, at least you know what my principles are. You know that the next libertarian is, is going to have the same principles, that tomorrow's libertarian is going to have the same principles. Uh, what, are the, what are the principles of the Democratic and the Republican parties? The, the Republicans didn't even have a platform two years ago. They, they thought, well, nobody votes on principles, so why bother? The Democrats have a, a platform which, which looks like Webster's Dictionary. You know, it's like every single thing that anybody could ever want to say, yeah, we're in favor of that. That's not what they do, but they write it down. No one's ever read it So, uh, you know, I, the, 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 the sad news is most voters, the vast majority of voters, young, old, they're not willing to vote. And there's a good reason for that. They don't have the time to vote. It's not high on the list of priorities. They, they, they just don't want to vote. This is endemic around the, the entire country. Voters are having the uh, low level involvement of voter. What we need to do, because that, that's human nature. There's so many things to do in this world today that have time left over for politics. It's like, oh, you know, I just, I, I'm doing too much already. That's the way the vast majority of all voters all across the country are. Uh, there's a very few number that get really involved, they get really active, they try really hard. If they're members of the recipe for uh, one of the two Democratic Republican parties, uh, they can actually see success half the time. They're going to break half the time. Uh, you know, they'll be disappointed the other half the time. Uh, but what we really would like to see is a lot of people uh, evolve more. Uh, but the answer to that is not to beg them to be involved. Good luck with that. They're busy. So the real answer is to vote for a party that has principles. 
Because now the only thing you need to know is you need to know what the principles of the party are. And they don't change much, trust me on that one. They, they, change, they fight tooth and nail over changing the word of the libertarian platform. Uh, so all you have to do is sort of learn it gradually over time, you know, a couple of elections, uh, know where to find that on the web. Uh, and then the next time around, you, you don't have to know too much. Just I, the principles are the same. I, I, I like the principles of the vote for libertarian. So uh, that's a long answer. First, every one of my answers is way too long. Yeah, go ahead. Um, <clears throat> what's your opinion on IO licensing laws that prevent and restrict small business startups? Prevent what? Prevent small business from starting up. So well, I get rid of every single one of them. We need small businesses. We also need big businesses. But there's no reason to put a roadblock in the way of somebody who wants to start a business. Like, Iowa is the worst, what they call a license, licensure, occupational licensure state in the entire country. Nobody's worse than us. You gotta go to college for two years to be a barber. You know how long you have to go to college to be a, I don't know, pick your profession, firefighter, police officer. And I, I, I'm pretty sure it's harder, it should be, to become a good EMT or a police officer or a firefighter than to become a barber. I'm not trying to blast barbers, but you know, a person that knows how to cut your hair is probably gonna get a lot of business. A person that doesn't know how to cut your hair is it's probably not going to be a barber for very long. We have so many of them. I'm going to eliminate everyone in Iowa. I just off of that. Period. They're gone. Now, if you're licensed to do something in a different state, you can use that license in Iowa. We get rid of our entire licensing bureaucracy, which saves us some money. And it cuts, you know, we lose, people lose their jobs, but, you know, they're going to find something else. Um, you know, if you think it through, you'll realize, like, well, we, we, we don't lose anything. We just let other people do the work. Uh, but there's some jobs that uh, Iowa requires a license for, but no other state does. So, since no other state requires a license, I guess we don't either do it. So, there's no loss of it. Go ahead. I guess I have a personal qualm with what you just said. Um, Are you licensed? Personally, no, but other states don't require licensure for teachers. And so that means that they have lower educational standards within their school districts and for their educators. But in Iowa, we require four year degrees, certifications, endorsements, and licensure. So if you were to say bringing educators from Alabama into Iowa who don't have the proper education or licensure to educate our children in Iowa, they wouldn't have the same standards of education. So I guess what's the logic there of bringing people who are not licensed? Well, let me ask you a simple question. Are you a great teacher? Is that you? No. Well, let's pretend. Let's take it off. Okay. So, I will require four years of education in order to become a teacher. What if you had the option of just starting out as a, a, a teacher's aide? Right? Uh, it's going to be lower paid, but uh, going to a year of college is going to cost you a lot more. So, you avoid that, you get paid. And then, if you're good, which you may be or you may not be, then you get to be the assistant teacher or something. Uh, and then if you're good enough, through observation, parents like you, uh, kids like you, uh, parents think you're doing a great job, uh, then you can become a teacher. Now, along the way, you might decide that, boy, I need to know more. Uh, so I'm going I'm to work on, by myself. I might take some college classes. I might even go to college. Uh, but you're going to take this, the classes that you need to, to learn about uh, so that you can be a good teacher. In, in Iowa, Teachers don't take the classes that they want to take. They, they take the classes that are prescribed by a bunch of politicians in Des Moines. What, what, how, how would those politicians in Des Moines have a idea of what's necessary to become a good teacher? That, that, that's, that's just not, not, it's not normal. They're teachers. Like, of course, I'm a part of They're farmers and they're businessmen and they're professional politicians. There's a different way to get to where you want to go that costs you less because you don't have to do that four years like it, like it is today. Uh, it will probably make you a better teacher because by the time you get to be a teacher, you'll have at least four years' experience. These college grads, they have what, uh, one quarter? Uh, they have some, some experience. But teaching is not something that uh, you get by getting a college degree. That, that, that's, that's not the definition. If that were the definition, there would be no bad teachers in Iowa. Now, I will say this I got a great public education in Iowa before I left, you know, uh, and I had some bad teachers. I learned a lot from my bad teachers. They drove my dad, he was a teacher. They drove him crazy. Because he knew how bad they were. But, you know, 
the current system doesn't pro uh, provide a perfect teacher every time you get somebody in a diploma. Uh, and there should be a better way to do it. It's the same with other uh, skills like mechanic. You don't have to go get a degree from Kirkwood like I did to, to be an attractive thing. You can just go to work. And they're not going to say overhaul that combine and, uh, and you know, get it done by Tuesday. Uh, they're going to say, you know, we're going to start out with uh, you know, uh, draining the oil and putting it into oil. But slowly but surely, you're going to learn on the job. And you're going you're to work hard. You're going to take classes online. And you're going to go to institutes and all that kind of stuff. And someday, you're going to be an immigrant mechanic. And everybody's going to know it. The, the people that pay you are going to say, hell yeah, it's, you know, he'll, he'll take care of that combine for you. He's our best man. Uh, the idea that you need a four-year degree automatically, without exception, is just, it's just not true. So if that Alabama teacher who's a, you know, a bum, because they were educated in Alabama, uh, comes up here to Iowa and wants to teach, it's not like they're going to get a job uh, just because they're, 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 they're qualified in Alabama. First, they have to get hired. And then they're going to get an interview. The interviewer might say, wow, you, you look good. Uh, you know, let's, let's see if you uh, do classes for a week. I want to assume they're videotaping or something. Uh, every other position, uh, it, it doesn't require that you have to have a college degree. It doesn't even require that you have a college degree when it's very costly uh, and uh, it doesn't guarantee any results. You know, I don't think that uh, Elon Musk has a degree, does he? Yeah. But he seems to be doing okay. Bill Gates never got his degree. I think he did okay. It's, it's very easy to, to, to be a really good at something without a, like a piece of paper that says you went to college. I can miss you though, because that's my job. Side 
or the other. I look at specific things to see whether or not, is that, is that a good thing or a bad thing or a little thing? Do we need more research? Uh, and I pick and choose. But I don't care the person that proposes it, or I don't care what party supports it. I'm looking for things that make sense. Because we, we're, it's going to be hard to change the two-party system. And the only way I know is if people start voting libertarian. But uh, we can impact individual laws. Okay? So yeah, sometimes protesting is very effective, especially at the local level. You know, put together a dozen people outside the supervisor's uh, uh, office to his office, uh, entrance to his office. I, I'm not really big on going to somebody's house. For God's sake, would you leave people alone and allow them to have a private life without going and acting as if somehow or other you're morally superior? But in front of their office, right, in front of the, the place where the person works, that's a perfectly good place. That's a public place. But a dozen protesters and see rabbits in front of somebody's office just a couple of times. They're going to get a news story. They're going to have to think about it. You, you will have an impact. So my, my proposal on that one is do the things that are going to make an impact. Sometimes it's just showing up and standing. Sometimes it's uh, you know, holding a big sign or being a little bit more uh, towards the front of the crowd. Uh, and always understand that, you know, I don't have any heroes and I don't have any uh, villains. I'm sorry. Donald Trump's not a villain to me. I, I, I wouldn't enjoy staying out you know, to, to have a beer with him. You know, I, I wouldn't accept an invitation. But he's not a villain, he's just a Donald Trump. And Joe Biden's not like, my worst enemy. You know, I, I, I have no problem with him as a person. I don't have any problem with him. They're all just like us. There's three, what? No, it's not three. It's uh, 330 million Americans. You will not find a handful of them that I do not respect as a human being. They're just like me. I try to put my head in their space. Of course, I will never be successful. But I try to imagine, what's it like to be a, you know, a mass murderer? I, I don't have any sympathy for them that are alive. I don't want to be let out of prison like just because you know you did your job. Uh, I'm not opposed to them being let out of prison, but I think of people as individuals. I think of policies as policies. I don't think of political parties as something that's good or bad. I just think of like what have they done? And I don't condemn every Republican for stuff that I disagree with. I don't condemn every Democrat for stuff that I disagree with. We're all individuals. We need to understand that uh, you know. You can't love anything other than a person. Oh, maybe you're right. But you, know, you, you can't love a group. Love is the most important human emotion. And it's one of the most important things in our lives. We should not let hate and fear dominate. We should always look for the center, look for the love that's out there, no matter who it is, and, and see if you can pick up on, on, on the, the, their lives and exude love and, and probably get a little bit more. Long answer to a short question. Who's next? Hey, go ahead. I couldn't find anything on your website, but um, what's your stance on abortion? What's my stance on abortion? Uh, okay, uh, I do get that question. Surprise, surprise. Uh, I believe life begins at conception. Uh, I'm not a scientist, but it seems like that's what scientists think also. Uh, if they change their mind, I'll probably be very close to their radio, I'll change mine. Uh, I think life should be honored, it should be loved, it should be protected. That's, I mean, we're, that's another human being, right? I, I, I don't just love the, the 330 million people that have already been born, but I, I, I start loving I start loving my children at the moment of conception. And I have a lot of friends that got pregnant and had children, and I start loving their children at the moment of conception. I also have friends who got abortions. Uh, and, you know, I just, I never had a chance to start developing love for, for that unborn child. So, let's think this through. Abortion is possibly the, the biggest struggle the human family has ever had. We didn't start arguing about this yesterday. We didn't start arguing about this five years ago, or 10 years ago, or 15 years ago, when Roe v. Wade was passed. We've been trying to figure out the answer to abortion for thousands of years. The smartest philosophers, the smartest rulers, the smartest generals, the smartest uh, writers, They've all been trying to answer this question about the human family. And different religions have answered that question. You know, the, Jew, the, 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 the Jewish religion has answers that are there, and they're really good for them. And the Muslim religion has answers for, for them that are really good for them. And the Christian religion, of course, we have lots 
lots of branches. So each one of those branches has an answer that's good for the people who belong to that branch. Right? And we should respect the fact that none of us have yet to meet the Supreme Being. Maybe we never know. Maybe, maybe the Supreme Being doesn't exist, but none of us have met that Supreme Being yet. Uh, and if someone knows the true, one and only true answer to whether or not abortion is ever acceptable, then yes, it's, it's that guy, that book, right? It's the goddess. So let's not try and pretend that we're the supernatural being and we've got it all figured out. Because we probably have got it figured out for ourselves. And we probably don't have the slightest idea what we're talking about when we start talking about somebody else. So the last place I would ever look for guidance on the abortion question is a damn politician. What the hell are you you're asking? These vile characters to, to, to give you an answer on one of the most perplexing questions in the entire history of humanity? No, thank you. So, as far as I'm concerned, no politician should never speak about abortion except privately. They should never propose any laws about abortion. Uh, it should be a it should be a situation which is taken care of by the mother, because we always love mothers, never do that, her partner, her family, her spiritual advisor, her doctor, the friends that she trusts. And they might come to a different answer, but I would. But they came to the right answer for her. And I don't trust any politician to be wiser than that. Social Security, we wind it down. 
Uh, we're we're going to have to pay those people like me who uh, you know, are already retired, they're already getting checked, they built their life around getting that check. You can trim at the top, but fundamentally we're going to pay most of the people off. Uh, but we're going to start reducing it uh, slowly over the course of 10 to 20 years uh, so that, uh, like, I don't know, let's just say you're 60, uh, we're going to make you a little bit because you've still got five years left to save more money than your father is going to save. So uh, we're going to distribute the pain. If you're 20 years old, um, you know, okay, you're never, you're never going to get social security that program's going to be going on before you get here. The, the question then becomes, uh, how do you do that uh, and still stay, uh, still keep the ship afloat? Uh, and the answer is going to be, well, we're going to have to trim until we can. So yeah, we're going to have to trim the top, we're going to have to trim those benefits down. But meanwhile, so that we're not just, uh, we don't have a, a spot where uh, people can not save and then they live in the when they're 65. Um, I, I have to live that with a problem. It wasn't a problem in 1931. It was, old people weren't uh, like living in desperate poverty all across America. A few were. More than we'd like to have. But most of the people that got a Social Security check in 1934, they were not in that situation. They had saved their money. My grandmother was one of those. Right? They had their money saved. They weren't rich either. But they, they saved their money because they didn't think there was ever going to be any help. And she always said, to yeah, that social security really helps. Well, you know, you can send a check to anybody and they're insane health. It was it wasn't consistent. So uh, social security needs to be run down, but if we don't trust you, because you know you, you might not say it, then uh, we, we could still say, well, we're gonna take money and put it into a 401k for you. Because it's your money, right? We take your money, we're gonna put it in the government 401k. Uh, maybe you can manage it a little bit yourself, like we do with the private industry. Uh, but uh, we're going to force you to say because we don't trust you. I mean, I, that's not me. I, I do trust you. I trust you a lot. I trust you completely. But uh, over, the, over the whole country, you know, we can force people to say that it's their money. And so there's no problem. They'll always get it back. The, go, the government might go back up, but you're still going to have your forward pay because it's going to be an investment in the Medicare is the same way. But if you just start raising the price and you go to the market and say, we need insurance for people that are over the age of 65. Please start selling it. Make it easy for them to sell it. They will. Uh, and then over the course of time, they're going to just subsidize it less and less. Something like you, you're never going to get free medical care. You're going to have to buy your own. Uh, Medicaid is a little bit harder. But the answer to that is a universal basic income, which is we're going to require a tax. You, know, you can't give everybody money every year unless you have some place to get the money from. The government doesn't have any money. They're going to have to get it off the tax break. But if you slowly implement a universal basic income, which is not the ideal solution in theory, but it might be the ideal solution in, in the practicality. Okay? Uh, you reduce 100% of the welfare state, no more farmers get money, no more uh, you know, uh, starving mothers get money, no more babies get money, but everybody gets money. And it's the same amount of money for everybody. But everybody has to pay a tax that funds it. And when you, when you hit that balance, it's, it's perfect. Right? It's really easy. Once you get that announcement of taking from the same amount of money, it doesn't pay uh, So that would be a way that doesn't necessarily reduce government spending. Uh, but what it does is that we get a lot more value for our money, which is a little bit like saving money. You know, if I could buy two donuts for a dollar, and then I figure out how I can get three donuts for a dollar, I still have to pay a dollar, but I got three donuts. So that's what the UBI does. It gives us three donuts. Right now, we're just getting two in the money. Government's just basically wasting most of the money they can give them. Uh, there's a lot of other areas. I mean, and the drug war, I think that's a hundred million, billion dollars a year. Gee, let's just put a couple people in prison and uh, you know, we, we save a hundred million dollars. So that, that, that's right on the cap. Uh, a lot of the other programs that are called the discretionary things that uh, would be wrapped up into the UBI. Uh, if you have the military budget, the only other thing you need to find is the, the purpose of the American military. If you redefine the purpose of the military, of the American military is to defend our borders against foreign invaders. You don't have to spend as much. You might not have to spend anything because everybody already has a gun. Who's going to attack a country where every single person in the country has got half a dozen uh, pretty damn good weapons in their closet? Uh, you know, I think I'll, I think I'll go to a camp, some place where they've disarmed the populace. Uh, but uh, even if we uh, are afraid of uh, greater threats than Canada and Mexico, um, we can still do it for a lot less money. Uh, 
you know, we create a lot of our own problems by going overseas and fighting other people's problems. Now, I am very uh, sympathetic to these people. I, I, I'm empathetic for people who live in a crappy country that's at war with another crappy country. I don't like that at all. But you know what? If I put my foot in, I put my, I put my foot in shit. There's so much blowback from us trying to be the global police. I mean, the, the, the Osama bin Laden, the only beef he had with us was what? We wouldn't move our tents from one side of the border to the other side of the border. That's the only thing. He just wanted us to get out of Saudi Arabia, and he was happy to go to Iran. And we're so obstinate. We're such fools. We wouldn't be, we said, yeah, we would like our tents where they are. So you know, we took that one of those Almost every one of those words that you've heard, and I know about that word a lot, uh, they, they, they basically, we, Cause trouble and then, and then people didn't like it and we had to fix it. I think I'm out of time. My good friend Brian Jack over here is, uh, he deserves a full hour and not uh, only 59 minutes. So thank you very much. Thanks for showing up. Thanks for those interesting questions. Uh, it, you know, I never even bring literature or tell anybody what my web page is. If you can't find me, it means you don't know my name. <laughs> just go to the internet. My website is Rick Spruit. If you want to find me on Google, just Rick Stewart, Iowa, Sheriff, there's all kinds of things.